Hello everyone, this is Mr. Baxley, and I am recording a YouTube video for my regular U.S. history class. I know it's been a while, but I thought that this was a good idea to get y'all some of the information that you've been missing while we're out of school. So anyways, welcome to this YouTube channel. I'll be trying to put up some lectures for y'all to watch to help you uh, cover some of the gaps that are missed in that reading package. And before we go any further, I'd like to clarify a little bit of the instructions for those reading packets. So I'm getting a lot of good homework turned back in by a lot of students, but a few students I haven't heard from. So if you can, leave a comment on this video with your name and say, hey, I watched this video. And if you have any questions about the reading packets and what's expected of you, you can go ahead and leave a question here or you can email me at my email. All right, but I know it's been a while, when we left school before spring break and before all this mess happened, we were learning about the 1960s and the 1970s. And so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the decade that was the 1970s. Before we go any further though, this video was sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is a sick RTS, no, I'm, I'm just playing. No, this is a video that's not sponsored by anyone, but I'm trying to share at least a little bit of what you've been missing in class. So let's talk about the 1970s. The 1970s saw the downfall of a president. Arguably the greatest scandal in modern presidential history is the scandal known as Watergate. Before we left school, I taught you a little bit about a president named Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon ran for president in 1968 the same year that Robert Kennedy, the brother of John F. Kennedy, was shot. That year, Richard Nixon, the Republican, won the presidential election, and he was a candidate for law and order. We talked about Richard Nixon before a little bit. He was a very successful president at the beginning. He was very successful in diplomacy. He was very good at negotiating with the Soviet Union or Russia, and he was very good at negotiating with China and he got a lot of deals made that helped make the Cold War a little less scary. But Richard Nixon had some skeletons in his closet. When it was time for his reelection, the year was 1972. And on June 17, 1972, during the middle of the presidential campaign, there were five men arrested. They were arrested for breaking into the headquarters of the Democratic Party's National Committee located in the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. These five men were no ordinary crooks, though. They didn't come to steal. They came to spy. They were spying on the Democratic National Committee to help the Republican Party win the presidential election, and they were found to be members of something called the Committee to Re-elect the President, or a CREEP for Richard Nixon, which by the way is a terrible acronym. If you're gonna make an organization, don't give yourself a acronym like CREEP, okay? Because that just is creepy and it sounds bad and it doesn't look good on you, okay? They were arrested, they were putting wiretaps in phones, they were looking through documents, they were doing all sorts of bad stuff to try to cheat and win the 1972 election, but, they didn't ever really get in trouble. After they got arrested, they were let go, and the whole thing was covered up. There was a part of the Nixon administration called the plumbers, and their job was to keep any bad news from getting out. They would plug the leaks that might hurt President Nixon's reputation. And they worked to help reelect Nixon, and they had connections with Creep, and people working for Richard Nixon had actually ordered the break-in. So the cover-up was successful at first. No one found out about the Watergate scandal at first. And when the 1972 election happened, Nixon won in a landslide. Richard Nixon won 49 out of the 50 states. That is insane. Look at this map right here, okay? Every state in the country except for Massachusetts voted for Richard Nixon. That includes California, New York, some of the states in this country where you think they would never elect a Republican. Back in 1972, they all voted for Richard Nixon. This is the Watergate Hotel. In 1972, though, 
people didn't know that Richard Nixon had cheated to win this election. But the secret did not stay a secret. In 1973, there's a man named James McCord, and he admits in a letter that the Nixon administration had ordered the cover-up. And the Senate of the United States created a committee to investigate the Watergate scandal. As they started the investigation, a lot of the people that worked for Richard Nixon started to resign. Left and right, people were just jumping off, like rats jumping off of a sinking ship. Even Richard Nixon's personal lawyer, John Dean, agreed to cooperate with the Senate, and he informed them of the president's involvement. And so if your lawyer decides to turn on you, that's really bad. Because typically your lawyer is the guy you pay to lie for you. And so your lawyer knows all your dirty secrets. So when Richard Nixon's lawyer decided to cooperate with the Senate, Nixon knew his goose was cooked. Nixon made a speech where he publicly stated that he was not a crook. But as the investigation continued, people learned that Richard Nixon had a habit of taping all the conversations in the president's office. That means that every single thing that was said in the Oval Office was on record. And so Congress obviously demanded to see the tapes. They wanted to know if Richard Nixon had been telling the truth or if he had been lying because the tapes would have the evidence. And this actually went to the Supreme Court. Congress demanded the tapes. The president refused to give the tapes. So our third branch of government, the Supreme Court, they had to step in. And in the Supreme Court case, United States versus Richard Nixon, the Supreme Court ordered Richard Nixon to give Congress the tapes. And so Richard Nixon complied, but 17 minutes of the tapes were missing. What was on those 17 minutes of tapes? I have no idea. Could have been aliens. Could have been Elvis Presley showed up and started talking. Who knows, okay? Or maybe it was about the Watergate scandal, or maybe it was about something totally different. Nobody knows, because those minutes are missing. If you want to, you can leave a comment telling me what you think was on those missing tapes. But regardless, the rest of the tapes told a story. And while this was happening, it was all over the television. On the nightly news, people were getting updates about the trial, about the scandal, and about Richard Nixon, and more and more. And it seemed like it was inescapable. Everywhere you looked, there was news about Watergate. And people were getting plain old sick of it. But people were also getting sick of Richard Nixon. When the public was able to read the tape transcripts, they found out that Richard Nixon was not a nice guy. Out in public, he had a very nice, proper manner, you know, kind of like how you are out in public. But when you're at home, maybe you talk a little bit differently with your family. Well, Richard Nixon sounded all nice when he was out in public. But when he was in his office, he swore like a sailor and acted like a bully. And people didn't like it. Here's some pictures of some of the tape recorders that Richard Nixon used. Okay, the Nixon tapes, some of the Watergate hearings. Okay, and in those tape transcripts, there was enough details that showed that Richard Nixon knew about Watergate. And he had helped deal with the cover-up. And so Richard Nixon was about to be impeached. The way the impeachment works is that it is a way for our government to punish a person in the government that does something wrong. A president is not the only person that can be impeached. Lots of people can get impeached. If you work for the national government and you do something that is violates the right codes of conduct for that office, you do high crimes and misdemeanors of that sort of thing, you can get impeached. In our history, only three presidents have been impeached. The first one was Andrew Johnson, who was president after Abraham Lincoln died. The second one was Bill Clinton. And the third one is our current president, Donald Trump. But being impeached does not mean you get removed. The way it works is there's two steps. According to Article 2, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution, Congress has the authority to remove a president for misconduct under the following procedures. Step one. The House of Representatives has to vote to impeach. This is where they formally accuse the president of being bad. But that accusation doesn't kick you out. 
three presidents have been impeached, but to be removed, the Senate has to have a trial. And in that trial, two thirds of the Senate has to agree to convict the president. No president has ever been convicted. Now you might be saying, well, where does Richard Nixon fit in all this? Well, Richard Nixon knew that he was about to be impeached and he knew that he was probably going to be convicted. So before any of this ever happened, he decided to quit. On August 8, 1974, Richard Nixon realized he could not escape impeachment and removal, so he resigned or quit being a president. You can actually look up a video, and I would have shown this to you in class, but you can on your own time, look at the video where Richard Nixon announces his retirement. Richard Nixon is the only president to have ever resigned. Every other president has either served out the full term or died in office. When Richard Nixon resigned, Gerald R. Ford, the vice president, became president. When Gerald Ford became president, some interesting things happened. First off, Gerald Ford is the only president to never have been elected. This is kind of an interesting little quirk in history, but what happened was Richard Nixon had a different vice president when he started out. Richard Nixon's first vice president was a guy named Spiro Agnew. Spiro Agnew also got in trouble for corruption and he had resigned too. And the way our system works is that if the vice president quits, the president has the authority to appoint a new vice president. So for example, if today Mike Pence, our president, our vice president, just decided to resign, Donald Trump, the president, could pick someone new to replace him with the Senate's approval. But Richard Nixon did this and he appointed Gerald Ford. So Gerald Ford never actually won an election as president or vice president. So he was appointed and then he became president whenever Richard Nixon resigned. So Gerald Ford became president and no one had ever voted for him to be president. And Ford's first major action as president was pardoning Richard Nixon. What a pardon means is he forgave him. The president has a lot of power to pardon criminals, okay? That means that the president, any crime that someone commits against the United States, unless they've been impeached, pretty much any crime, the president can just say, you're forgiven. And that's what Gerald Ford did. See, Richard Nixon had been kicked out of being president, but that didn't stop Richard Nixon from facing other trials. And so Richard Nixon was about to go to jail. And Gerald Ford thought that that would just not work. He said, we need to move on. He said, we have been dealing with Watergate for months. For months and months and months, the United States has been dealing with the crisis of Watergate. And he says, we need to move on. If we don't move on, there's going to be trials after trials after trials after trials, and it's just going to go on forever. And so Gerald Ford said he could pardon all the crimes all at once. And so he just forgave Richard Nixon. He forgave Richard Nixon for cheating, for covering up the cheating that had been done to win the election. He forgave him for everything so that the nation could begin healing. This was very controversial. Many people were outraged. They wanted justice. They wanted Richard Nixon to go to jail for his crimes. Gerald Ford said we needed to move on. By pardoning Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford admitted that Richard Nixon had done wrong. Today, many historians think that Gerald Ford made the right call. But at the time, Richard Nixon was so unpopular that Gerald Ford's pardon made him unpopular too. So let me know what you think. Take a moment right now and put down in the comments whether you think it was right or wrong to forgive Richard Nixon. Should Gerald Ford have thrown Richard Nixon in jail or should he have forgiven him? Let me know. On top of this, the 1970s saw the worst economic recession since the 1930s. In the 1930s, we had the Great Depression. In the 1970s, we have another recession. That means the economy was slowing down. And what we experienced was something called stagflation. What that means is that the economy stagnated, which is high unemployment, while also facing high inflation. 
which is higher prices. So those two things smashed together is stagflation. Stagnation and inflation together, stagflation. Think about it this way. People were losing their jobs and stuff was becoming more expensive. Inflation means that prices are rising and that your dollar is worth less, okay? Inflation happens all the time. Things that used to cause, cost a dollar a year ago, today might cost a dollar and five cents. Think about chips, okay? You probably remember when you were a kid going to the store and buying a bag of chips for say a dollar. And today you go to the same store and buy the same chips and it costs a dollar 25 or a dollar 50. That's inflation. So it's really bad when prices go up and people are losing their jobs. So you lost your job and things are more expensive. This is a big problem. And Gerald Ford, he inherits this problem when he becomes president. In 1974, inflation rates were 11%. That means that everything that costed a dollar in 1973 now costed a dollar and 11 cents in 1974. So think about it from a different perspective. That's like if someone went through your bank account and took out 11% of your money. Pretty close to what's going on around, you know, let's say you have $1,000 in your bank account and someone just takes $100 out but for everyone across the country. That's what was going on. So Gerald Ford tried to fix it with a program called Whip Inflation Now, or WIN, which tried to control prices through voluntary efforts, but it didn't work. This is Gerald Ford. The healing begins. Here's a little chart of stagflation. The economy is slowing down while prices or inflation is going up. Gerald Ford also became president right whenever the 1970s saw us lose a major war. Remember what war that was? It was the Vietnam War. We lose the Vietnam War back in 1973. And in 1975, while Gerald Ford is president, South Vietnam falls to communism. So Gerald Ford is like the unluckiest president, okay? He wasn't even really supposed to be president in the first place. He takes over after Richard Nixon, one of our worst presidents because of the scandal. He forgives him, makes everyone mad. The economy goes terrible. We lose Vietnam. And then all of a sudden we start seeing terrorism. Okay. In the 1970s, we see a growth in international terrorism. Terrorism is the use of violence to terrify a population into giving in to a group's demands. Groups like the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, killed thousands in Northern Ireland. In the Middle East, there are Arabic gunmen that murdered 11 Israeli athletes at the 1972 Olympics. During the 1970s, there's a series of wars that happen over a country called Israel. The United States had supported the nation of Israel, which was a pro-Western democracy in the Middle East, since it was established in 1948. And Israel has been our steadfast ally, ally ever since. In 1973, though, there were several Arab nations that tried to kill or destroy Israel in the Yom Kippur War. During the Yom Kippur War, Israel fought back and defeated all of their enemies at once. But during that war, they were using a lot of supplies that were given to them by the United States. The Arabic countries that surrounded Israel were angry at the United States for supporting Israel. And so, a group of countries called the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, ordered an embargo on the sale of oil to the United States. A lot of these countries in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, had a lot of oil, and they sold that oil to the United States. An embargo is when you refuse to sell something. So, whenever they refuse to sell oil to the United States, that was called an embargo. They did that because they were angry at the United States for supporting Israel during the Yom Kippur War. This caused gas shortages and increased inflation. So all of a sudden, the price of gas was doubling overnight. And the supply of gas was lowered to the point that there wasn't enough gas for everyone to do what they wanted to do. All of a sudden, there were massive lines at gas stations all across the countries. People were not able to buy gas 
just like they want to. You know, like today you can go to the gas station, get as much as you want. But back during this time, they rationed it. This is actually a little topical. Right now, you might notice things like toilet paper and other things having shortages, and there are like limits on how much you can buy at the store of how much toilet paper or how much canned goods or how much this or how much that. That happened to the United States, but with oil in the 1970s. And all of a sudden, you couldn't just go to the gas station and buy however many gallons you wanted. You might be limited to 10 gallons at a time. You might only be able to go to the gas station on a Monday, Wednesday, or a Friday, or they might give you a card or something like that. All across the country, there were massive lines to go to get gas, okay? Look at this, right? The price of gas went up. Some places, they just ran out of gas. They didn't have enough gas, and so they had to close up shop. And so all this happens, and who, does, who gets the blame? This guy right here, Gerald Ford. He gets the blame for this, he gets the blame for inflation, and a lot of people are mad at him about Richard Nixon. So needless to say, Gerald Ford does not win re-election. In 1973, this oil crisis happens, stagflation happens, Richard Nixon gets pardoned, all this had ruined Gerald Ford's reputation. So in 1976, a guy named Jimmy Carter runs against him. Jimmy Carter was a Democrat. He was a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher and a Democrat from a rural area of Georgia. He ran as an outsider who could drain the swamp of corruption in Washington, D.C., and he won. And Jimmy Carter became our next president. Now, Jimmy Carter, though, he takes over, and it doesn't just get magically better all at once. Jimmy Carter faces stagflation and he tries to fix it. He tries to cut taxes, he tries to cut government spending, tries to help people out, but it just gets worse. During Jimmy Carter's presidency, annual inflation grew to 18%. So that dollar that used to be able to buy a bag of chips, now you need a dollar and 18 cents to buy that same bag of chips. And that's going up every year. Every year it's getting worse. Meanwhile, unemployment remained high as 8%. One of Jimmy Carter's successes was that he, that he was able to broker a peace agreement between Israel and Egypt in the 1978 Camp David Accords. This helped get rid of the oil crisis, okay? Israel and Egypt had been fighting, and they were able to come to peace, and this helped open up the way for oil to be sold to the United States again. Now, during the same time period, though, communism is spreading. Remember, we're still in the Cold War. The Soviet Union is still trying to spread communism, and the United States wants to contain communism, okay? And in the late 1970s, the Soviet Union is trying to aggressively expand communism. Nicaragua becomes communist. In 1979, the Soviet Union invades the country of Afghanistan. Okay, now, at that moment, the United States and the Soviet Union were trying to work out a treaty to reduce their nuclear weapons. But whenever the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, that gets canceled. We're mad. We tell Soviet Union, why are you invading Afghanistan? You are not going to spread communism to Afghanistan. And so we get in a big argument about that. And pretty much the detente that Richard Nixon had built up through his negotiations just goes away and the Cold War heats up again. The United States decides to not go to the Olympics in 1980. In 1980, the Olympics was scheduled to be in Moscow, the capital of the Soviet Union. We refused to go. Then we refused to sell wheat to the Soviet Union. The United States exported a lot of wheat or bread, stuff that you need to make bread with, to the Soviet Union. And we get so mad at the Soviet Union for invading Afghanistan, we say, you know what, you're cut off. You're not going to get any more of our bread anymore. This leads to the Soviet Union and the United States being really upset at each other. Okay, here's some images of the Soviet Union invading Afghanistan. These are the rebels in uh, Afghanistan, known as the Mujahideen. They fought against the Soviet Union. And while they were doing this, the United States gave them weapons and money. This is kind of like the Vietnam for Russia, 
In the Vietnam War, the United States in, went inside Vietnam and tried to put down a communist revolution, and we gave money and weapons and supplies to the anti-communist forces in Vietnam. The same thing happens, but in reverse with Afghanistan. Russia invades Afghanistan. The people of Afghanistan fight back, and we give them weapons. So the United States gives these Mujahideen rebels, we give them machine guns, we give them rockets, we give them all sorts of stuff to shoot at the Soviet Union and their tanks and helicopters. And this starts to bleed the Soviet Union dry. The Soviet Union loses lots of soldiers invading Afghanistan. They waste lots and lots of money in Afghanistan. And the United States, we do everything we can to bleed the Russians dry. We don't want them to expand communism in Afghanistan. So we give the Muslim rebels lots of weapons, lots of materials, lots of money to keep these Russians back. And it actually helps lead to the Soviet Union collapsing. The Soviet Union wastes so much money in Afghanistan, loses so many lives, it weakens their country dramatically. But the biggest crisis that happened during Jimmy Carter's presidency is something called the Iranian hostage crisis. Okay, so let's talk about Iran. Iran is a country to the east of Iraq, okay? And Iran had for a long time been an ally of the United States. They were led by a dictator named Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, or as he's more commonly known as the Shah. He was a dictator. He was not a, he did not have democracy, but he liked the United States. And we actually put him into power to stop the spread of communism. We did not want communism spreading to Iran, so we supported the Shah who kept Iran away from communism. But in 1979, there is a revolution in Iran. This revolution though is not a communist revolution. This is a fundamentalist revolution. This is a very Islamic revolution. The fundamentalist Muslims that took over Iran were very, very conservative and very anti-Western. They hated anything that was not strictly according to their way of interpreting the religion of Islam, okay? They had a strict interpretation of Islam, and they thought that anything that wasn't like that was sinful. So the way that United States culture had influenced Iran was sinful to the fundamentalists. They did not like anything about the way the United States acted. They did not like the Christian influences or the Western influences on Iran that had come through the United States support of the Shah. And they wanted to get rid of everything in Iran that had anything to do with the United States. When this revolution happened, the Shah ran away. He ran away to the United States for medical care. He was sick. The people of Iran demanded that the United States give the Shah back to them so they could kill him or punish him. And the United States refuses. The Shah is our friend. We're not going to just betray him and let them kill him. So the Iranians get mad and they attack the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, Iran. Tehran is the capital of Iran and there is an embassy there where the United States ambassador and people who work for the United States can negotiate. Look, countries have embassies in other countries where their ambassadors can do, go so they can talk and negotiate and help each other out. So the United States has an embassy in Iran. It's like you know a building or a compound where Americans live and they have business dealings back and forth between the two countries. Well, the Iranians, they attack the embassy. And when they attack the embassy, a huge mob captures 52 Americans. 52 Americans are captured, and they are thrown in prison, and they are tortured for the next 444 days. In the United States, people would turn on the news, and they'd hear, today, Iranians captured this embassy, threw 52 Americans in prison. And they'd see pictures. The Iranians would take pictures of them, send them out. They would put videos out and torture them. And the Iranians said, if you want your hostages back, you give us back the Shah, or we're going to continue to torture them. And Americans had to watch other Americans suffer. Imagine turning on the news every night and seeing a counter. It's been 
57 days that these Americans have been held hostage. It's been 112 days that they've been held in hostage. It's been 143 days that they've been in hostage. It's been 279 days that they're in, in the hostages. And people all across the country looked at Jimmy Carter, the president, and they said, let's rescue these hostages. Iran is just this tiny little country in the Middle East. Why can't we just go in and smash them and take our people out? And Carter actually did try to rescue them on April 1980, but the rescue failed. And every day, those Americans were tortured. Every day, they were mistreated. Every day, they were thrown in prison. It made Carter look worse and worse and worse. So Carter, who came into office in 1970, he was elected in 1976, and he was this positive guy. By 1980, in the next presidential election, he looks like a failure. This is the Shah Mohammed Reza Pahlavi. These are the radical Islamic fundamentalists that take over Iran. This is them marching into the um, embassy of the United States to capture those Americans and torture them. And this fundamentalist revolution, it established Sharia law, a very strict law that makes anyone who live in that country abide by the law of the Quran, which is the Islamic book okay this is not the same as all muslims okay there's a lot of muslims that are very that, that's totally different it's like a whole different flavor okay but their very strict and very harsh regime was very very brutal to anyone who stepped out of line okay one of the hallmarks of sharia law is the hijab okay this idea that women need to be very conservatively dressed Okay, and that they can't, you know, show anything other than their face. Okay, before the Islamic Revolution, Iran was very Western. Okay, you saw Western clothing, Western hairstyles, and you saw a lot of independence for women. Okay, women had a lot of freedom and, and rights in Iran. After the Islamic Revolution, those rights disappeared under Sharia law. Okay, so especially for women in Iran, the Islamic Revolution was not very good for them, in my opinion. So, lots of bad things are going on. We'll talk, the plan is to talk about what's going to happen to save those hostages in the next video when we talk about the 1980s, because those hostages do get saved, but it's not by Jimmy Carter, it's by the next president, Ronald Reagan. Okay, but in the face of all this despair, what are people to do? Okay, Americans sought escape. A lot of times when things are bad and you turn on the news and just everything is scary, everything's bad, everything's depressing, people focus on themselves. The outside world is terrible, I can't change it, so I'm just gonna worry about me, okay? You turn on the news and everything's bad, I can't do anything about it, might as well just make my life better. So in many, many people called the 70s the me decade because people just focused on themselves, okay? There's a magazine called Self that became popular. Self-help books become popular. People try to express themselves in their fashion. You start to see increasingly outrageous clothing. People wear these wide lapels, these big collars, these big old suits called leisure suits. You see a lot of pastel colors. People's hair gets bigger and longer. And the sexual revolution continues. The feminist movement is continuing to go through. The 1970s is when the Equal Rights Amendment is really put forth. And we talked about that in an earlier lecture before we let out about how the feminist movement tried to change the Constitution uh, to get rid of any laws that treated men and women different. That effort failed, but the feminist movement continued to grow. Divorce rates increased through the 1970s. And you see a lot of self-indulgence in the 1970s. You see a lot of fads, okay? People are like, well, I can't fix the economy, so I'm going to get a pet rock. Or I'm going to go streaking or whatever. All sorts of weird fads become popular in the 70s. And even movies change. You know, when you go to the movies, you don't want to be reminded about how bad things are. When you watch a movie, you want to forget about your problems. Well, in a very similar way to how during the Great Depression, movies were popular, even though in the Great Depression, things were bad back in the 1930s, people still went to the movies and watched things like The Wizard of Oz or Gone with the Wind or King Kong, these big, massive movies that just 
you went into the movie theater and you forgot about your problems for a few hours. Well, that happened in the 1970s too. There's a lot of movies that come out in the 1970s that people just forget about their problems. And one of the most famous of these movies is Star Wars. The biggest sensation of, of entertainment, you know, that you can think of. Star Wars got its start in 1977 as just a small science fiction film. But it captured the American imagination because it was this really interesting story. You know, in the 1970s, people lost faith in their government. They lost faith because of you know things like the Watergate crisis, the fact that Richard Nixon had lied to the American people, the president, this most respected person, became disgraced. They lost faith in the economy because everything was going bad, inflation and unemployment. They lost faith in the rest of the world when they saw things like the communist expanding and terrorism. And so it was comforting to have a story that was simple. In Star Wars, there's good guys like Luke Skywalker and bad guys like Darth Vader. And it's simple and it's easy to understand. And you can go into the movie theater and for two hours, you can forget about all those problems. When you watch him flying around in a spaceship and shooting at each other, you're not worried about, you know, the fact that you don't have a job. You know, that's, that's over here and you're focused on the movie. And so people went and saw movies that were very much escapist, okay? These are some examples of 1970s fashion, big, outrageous clothing. This is the Brady Bunch. You know, the if you want to think of like 1970s fashion, here you go. Here's Star Wars. Now, there's always going to be a reaction in history. When you look at a movement, there's always going to be people opposed to a movement. So there's feminists. There's got to be someone opposed to that movement. Okay. When there's, you know, progressives, there's going to be conservatives, and there's always going to be those back and forth. Well, the back and forth that happened in the 70s is the rise of something called the new right. In the 60s and 70s, a lot of things changed in America, and many Americans didn't like those changes. They wanted to go back to more conservative times, okay? Back to a time before the sexual revolution, back to a time before abortion, back to a time before the Equal Rights Amendment or the Gay Rights Movement or the rising divorce rates or the rising crime rates. People wanted to go back to the good old days. They said, we don't like this new world. Well, that was the conservative movement known as the new right or the moral majority. What you start to see is American Christians becoming more politically involved. You see a combination of Christian leaders and conservatives form something called the new right. They actually had their roots back in the 1960s with this guy named Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater had ran and lost the presidential race in 1964 against Lyndon Johnson. Goldwater had argued that big government was the greatest threat to liberty and the cause of social problems. Goldwater said that anytime the government does something, it takes away people's freedom. If you tax the American people, you take away their freedom. If you do this program, you take away their freedom. So Goldwater said the best government was a small government. And even though Goldwater lost, his ideas went on. So he tried to win in 1964 and he failed. But 15 years later, at the end of the 70s, there's a lot of people that look back and say, hey, Barry had it right. We need to try that. So the new right took his ideas as inspiration. And they advocated cutting down the size of the government, getting rid of government spending, getting rid of taxes. And you see this alliance between big business conservatives and Christian conservatives who want more moral policies in American politics. They work together. And this really changes the Republican Party. The Republican Party becomes the party of evangelical Christians or American Protestants. And there's a lot of them in America. In the 1970s, nearly 25% of Americans identify as evangelical Christians, and they were led by fundamentalist preachers like Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, and these Christians reassert themselves politically, and they start voting as Christians, and you start to see a movement in society against those more liberal movements like the hippies and the feminist movement, you start to see more conservatives like the pro-life movement and the moral majority. And those two kind of fight over the cultural heart of the country, okay? Here's an example of some of these. This is, I believe, Jerry Falwell. This is, uh, this is Billy Graham. 
Billy Graham is a evangelical preacher. He is one of the most important faith leaders of the 20th century. Billy Graham had these massive revivals where thousands and thousands of people would attend all across the country, and they would hear him preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for people's sins and rose again to save them, and they believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they got saved, and you saw thousands of people all across the country get saved, and all across the world get saved because of Billy Graham, and they start changing their perspectives on politics with their faith. And you start to see more conservative movements in our politics as a result of evangelists like this guy, Billy Graham. And then we have the Christian Broadcasting Network, which is a television station for Christians and Christian news and things like that. And with that, we come to the end of our lecture about the 1970s. My plan is to release another lecture, hopefully later this week or next week, about the 1980s. And until I see you again, I want you all to know that I miss you hope you're doing well. Please be safe. And I want you to try to do this. Do good things, be good people, and make good choices. Leave me a comment in this video and let me know that you watched it. Let me know your thoughts. And if you have any questions, if you need any help, please let me know, okay? I hope y'all are all doing well, and I wish you all the best.